Good evening, all. Uh, welcome to this new international uh, roundtable organized by the International Researcher in Cooperative Studies on Occupational Health, the CIEXT. Thank you very much for being with us today. I am Louis Le Rouge, uh, Research Director at the French National Center for Scientific Research, member at uh, the Research Center for uh, Comparative Labor or Social Security Law at the University of Bordeaux and holder of the CIEXT. Une traduction simultanée en français est disponible. Pour sélectionner la langue adéquate, cliquez sur le bouton interprète à cet effet en bas de votre écran. Simultaneous translation in French is available. Please select your language by clicking on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. The theme which brings us uh, together today is Health at Work on Sustainable Work, Challenges and Hopes, according to social partners on occupational medicine, organized in the wake of the World Day for Safety and Health at Work, with the support of Ergonoma Journal and the International Labor Office, the ILO. To open this roundtable, the floor is now to Joachim Nunes, Chief of the Labor Administration, Labor Inspection and Occupation Safety and Health Branch Governance and Tripartism Department at the ILO. So uh, Joachim, you have the floor. Thank you. Merci Loïc and good morning, good afternoon to all, again, depending on the region of the world uh, where you are. Uh, listening to this this webinar, so I'd like first of all to congratulate the à vous en anglais et donc je tiens d'abord à remercier à la, la for organizing the webinar, which addresses a, a theme qui s'adresse à un thème qui est majeur. La parole on what are also by two uh, landmark declarations of the, of the organization, which are the the ILO Centenary Declaration for the Future of Work from 2019, and even uh, more recently, uh, the Global Call to Action for a Human-Centered Recovery from COVID-19. So in all of these fundamental texts of the ILO, you find references to uh, the importance of occupational health, well, occupational safety and health. Uh, one uh, uh, very uh, important expression of this importance is given, or was given by the Center Declaration, uh, that in 2019, that affirmed that safe and healthy working conditions are fundamental to decent work. And as you may know, uh, this year uh, in June, as a matter of fact, in a couple of weeks, our constituents, so our capital constituents, governments, employers, and workers organizations will decide, as a matter of fact, if safety and health uh, or safe and healthy working environments or safe and healthy working conditions, there is still uh, a discussion ongoing on which terminology to be used will become what in the ILO is uh, called a fundamental right at work. This is very important, why? Because um, fundamental principles and right at work uh, in the ILO mean that um, there is a, the recognition of one or more standards within you know, the many uh, conventions that the ILO has uh, that will be recognized as having a fundamental importance. And this will mean that every single member state of the ILO, independently of having ratified those conventions, will have the obligation to respect, to promote, and to realize the principles enshrined in the conventions are recognized as fundamental. So uh, the two conventions that are current, currently being discu discussed as potentially becoming fundamental are uh, convention number 155, so the Occupational Safety and Health Convention, or the Promotional Convention number 187. This is a fundamental importance. Why? Because these are the conventions, well, the 155 that uh, provides the obligation to countries, to member states, to define, implement, and periodically review a national policy on occupational safety and health, which encompasses all the different elements that a policy should have. And uh, also, uh, it sets a very well-defined frame of rights and obligations at the workplace level, so in terms of the duties and obligations of of employers and also of, of workers, well, duties and rights, of course. The Convention 187 is also a very important convention because it defines, again, for member states, the obligation of, in addition to the policy, uh, uh, setting up a national system, again, with all the internet interconnected elements that the system should have, uh, and uh, a, a national program to be practiced to implement the, uh, the policy. So this, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, if it is recognized, if one, of, one or, or both the conventions are recognized as fundamental uh, in, in June now, when we'll have in our, our International Labor Conference, this will be a major game changer. And we do hope that this will assist us to further promote 
the construction, you know, to build up a global uh, uh, culture of prevention, which is the aim that we have for many, many years, but we haven't been successful so far. We have to say this. Uh, we have to say that we have evolved in terms of preventing, uh, well, mostly preventing work accidents in many countries. And I would even say that especially in, in um, industrialized countries, uh, there is um, success to be recognized in terms of decreasing, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, the rates of fatalities uh, related to accidents in hazardous sectors. But even in, this is not the case for many other countries, uh, but even when it comes to occupational diseases, the, um, the scenario is not exactly the same. So I wouldn't say uh, that uh, countries in general have been so successful in terms of addressing occupational hazards, and uh, which according to our latest estimates, represent uh, uh, an average of 82% of fatalities uh, uh, related, to, related to work. So we can also, uh, uh, we, we cannot forget that, for example, according to the most recent estimates jointly developed by, jointly developed and launched by the ILO and the World Health Organization last year, uh, we have at least 90 million healthy life years that are lost because of, uh, because of injuries or disease caused only by 19 occupational risk factors. So in, we know that, you know, only exposure, only by the fact of being exposed to these 19 occupational risk factors, we have this uh, huge number of you know, loss of healthy life years. Uh, we also know that estimates develop elsewhere. For example, uh, the latest estimates developed by the ICO point out to a loss of 5.4% of global GDP, GDP uh, also because of accidents and diseases. So I would say that, yes, we have evolved, but we are not uh, yet, uh, obviously, where uh, we uh, need to, to be. Don't all, if I have let's think of all that you know, may happen uh, in terms of the effects of climate change, the consequences of climate change, uh, deforestation, uh, and also uh, advances in technology. Uh, we know that the technological progress is not always a synonym of safety. Well, let's just think, for example, of what happened in Beirut, Fukushima, Rana Plaza, so these are very well-known examples where you know, a single event can cause the death of hundreds or even thousands of people. Uh, I would say that uh, to also uh, leave here a positive message that COVID-19 was a great opportunity for us all to learn. Uh, so this pandemic really demonstrated that occupational safety and health, well, we are addressing mostly here occupational health, but let me refer uh, more broadly to occupational safety and health is a condition to ensure life, societal resilience, uh, business sustainability, and decent work at large. So we know that there is a toll uh, that already exceeds 6 million fatalities. Uh, from the ILO, uh, our estimates reveal that there is an increase in global poverty for the first time in two decades, uh, and an incredible, um, there is an incredible uh, uh, negative uh, effect in terms of Employment. So we don't need more evidence than this, I would say, uh, to understand uh, that the lack of safety and health at work and the lack also of investment in health, on health in general, uh, is uh, a cost, uh, a high burden for societies and, and, and economies. This is also a pandemic that uh, has uh, exposed vulnerabilities that uh, already existed, but I would say that they were highlighted. Uh, by the pandemic. Uh, they exposed vulnerabilities between workers. Many of us were able to stay at home teleworking. Many of us did not have that chance. Uh, and that, of course, also comes uh, with uh, consequences in terms of health. Uh, and we also know that uh, not every uh, country had the same opportunity in terms of you know, access to vaccines, access uh, you know, of their, their populations to healthcare, and even access to occupational health services. We know that in developing countries, for example, health services do not cover more than 20% of workplaces. So this, I would say, this is quite, this is quite serious. We also know that, uh, well, we all know here uh, uh, that occupational safety and health systems, uh, both at national, but also at workplace level are the same of many uh, interconnected elements. And this is not always acknowledged. And we also know that when of these elements fails, 
it's the entire the entire system that may collapse. Uh, and with the pandemic, what we saw is that some of these elements, as a matter of fact, are not there sometimes. We may not uh, have all the knowledge that we need about the occupational hazards or preventive and mitigation measures that we need to apply. We may have, and we do have legal frameworks that may not be adapted to you know, the new challenges we have and to the new risks. Uh, we may have legal frameworks that do not even cover you know, the entire population or, or the entire of the workplaces, excluding, for example, sectors or, or companies of smaller dimension. We may have a, a gap between law and practice as uh, levels of compliance with OSH uh, regulations uh, may be, uh, may be, and sometimes they are very, very low. And specialized qualification, and this is a very big problem for many countries, is scarce. Um, finally also, and this uh, leads us also very much to the theme of this, of this webinar, social dialogue may not be present or it may not be strong. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in some countries, uh, social dialogue may be uh, only a kind of a formality where we don't see really the engagement of, uh, or the opportunities for, for real engagement, for effective engagement of the social partners, workers organizations and employees organizations on the formulation of national policy and also their implication, their involvement on the implementation of these of these uh, of these policies. So there, there is a wealth of literature and debate on the future challenges for occupational safety and health. We speak of the globalized dimension of supply and you know the possible uh, fragilities that you know uh, uh, this means in terms of uh, uh, addressing global crises. We speak of conflict, uh, migration flows, refugees crises, changes in technology to which are referred uh, already, including automation, AI, all that relates to the gig economy. Of course, climate change, air pollution, environmental degradation. But what I would say uh, is that whatever the future brings, and it's always very difficult to forecast the future, of course, uh, uh, there is a, um, a solution, uh, at least for the ILO. We need to adopt what we call the human-centered approach that gives priority to life, gives priority to health through a coordinated and cooperative action and multidisciplinarity that acknowledges, again, the interrelation of all the elements that make part of safety and health at work, but that also look beyond uh, and also look into the interrelations between safety and health at work and working conditions, working conditions in, in general. So what we need is to build commitment, capacity, and infrastructure. So I'm looking forward for the dialogue that will emerge from this session uh, and the communications that we'll have the chance to, to hear here today. Thank you, and going back to you, Lloyd. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Joaquin, for your kind and important opening uh, words. For this subject, Health at Work and Sustainable uh, Work Challenges and Hope, according to social partners on uh, occupational medicine, I would like uh, to share a key sentence. Improving living and working conditions contributes to poverty reduction through economic growth and environmental uh, protection. In this sense, decent work must be seen as a pillar of sustainable development. The elimination of poverty uh, and the reduction of poverty cannot be achieved without full employment on healthy workers. Work produces everything we have. It supports the education system, the health system, the social security system, and the economy. However, we are faced with dynamic and evolving transformation and crises, which will testing them remind us more than ever of the importance of the principle embodied in international labor standards in the field of health and safety at work. These express the conditions for necessary protections on a systemic thinking approach commensurate with the serious and complex problems of society. This framework should not only meet the expectations of the most advanced regions in this field, but should offer all states taking into account their economic, social, and environmental situation as well as their resources, the conditions for continuous improvement of uh, the protection granted. Working on uh, the perception uh, of on representation uh, of legal standards by labor uh, on socioeconomic actors is a crucial issue. In other words, it is not a question of understanding occupational health and safety law as a burden, but rather of adopting an ethical approach that makes it's possible to understand that occupational health is a vector for well-being and performance. This approach should favor collective prevention and not add up individual prevention measures 
while questioning the responsibility of each individual within the workforce. It is therefore necessary to involve all actors with a particular commitment from the social partners in the development of proportional health policies on international national launch on company level. As Eugene Grant-Samond, Chief Medical Officer of the Norwegian Labor Inspection Authority, rightly pointed out at the opening of the World Day of Force Safety on Health at Work, research is one of these actors and the collective and social dialogue must be enriched by it in order to find solutions and innovate. The multidisciplinary approach to occupational health, as well as the development of policies to keep workers at work and to adapt work to people are case stones of proportional health policies and thus to develop a context conducive to the development of sustainable work that respect fundamental rights. According to the 13th principle of the Directive 391-89 and the fourth principle of the EU Directive 88-2003, the improvement of workers' safety, hygiene, and health at work is an objective which should not be subordinated to purely economic consideration. Thus, the overall objective is to contribute to the reconciliation of the economy, well-being at work on public and environmental health. This process would allow the development of values and meanings that would activate the skills and capaci capacities of each of the actors in the company through the prism of occupational health. In this way, this approach builds bridges between political and economic decisions on the one hand, and social and economic health policies on uh, the other. The construction of these bridges would favor the chances of an effective democracy in the enterprise on the refocusing of the human being at work within economic life and would no longer oppose health and performance. Put another way, the ambition, the ambition of this approach is to be able to promote a working environment conducive to health capable of work fostering a creative dynamic economy that respects social conditions. In this context, the voice of workers and the voice of employers may be heard with regards to a common challenge, the prevention of accidents and occupational diseases. This objective cannot be achieved without the involvement of occupational medicine. So in order to understand challenging and hope from social partners on occupational medicine, please welcome our panelists. Welcome to Marie uh, Bolland. She's going to moderate the roundtable. And uh, also, as discussion, she will present her thoughts in order to respond to other speakers on their comments. Marie uh, Bolland has worked in work uh, health and safety and industrial relations for over 20 years. Between 2015 and 2017, she was the executive director of Safe Work SA. Prior to uh, this, she had the, the position of director of policy and strategy. Director Community Engagement, Chief Policy Officer and Industrial Relation Inspector, all at SafeWork SA. During her, her tenure at SafeWork Safe SA, Marie Bolland played a key role in supporting the enactment and implementation of the South Australian version of the Model Work Health and Safety Act on Regulations. She was also actively involved in the policy on, on legislative work surrounding South Australia's referral of industrial relations forward to the Commonwealth. In November 2017, Mrs. Boland was appointed by Safe Work Australia as the independent reviewer of the model work health and safety law. She delivered her report on the review in December 2018, and the recommendations were actioned by Australian work health and safety ministers in May 2021. Key recommendations, including making new regulations to prevent psychological injury to, to work, work workers. In 2020, Mrs. Bolland undertook a review of the South Australia local government sector's work health and safety system. Her recommendations are being implemented. She's currently reviewing how the Australian capital territory manages its work health and safety uh, uh, prosecution. And Marie Bolland was the inaugural thinker in residence at the University of South Australia's Psychological Safety Climate Global Observatory Center for Workplace Excellence in November 2021. About the occupational medicines case, welcome to Dr. William Tigbe, who will represent the Society of Occupational Health. Dr. Tigbe is an occupational physician at the University of Hospital Birmingham and visiting lecturer in public health at the University of Warwick uh, in the UK. He is qualified in medicine in the Medical University of Warsaw. And after a short practice in clinical uh, medicine in Ghana, he undertook a master's degree 
in clinical nutrition at the University of Glasgow, or then a PhD in health sciences looking to work related its physical activity on cardiovascular risk at Glasgow Caledonian University. He also holds Master of Public Health from the University of Glasgow and work as a clinical lecturer uh, in public health at the University of Warwick since 2011. About the workers' case, welcome to class Michael Stoll, who will represent the European and International Trade Unions Confederation. He's a lawyer specialized in labor law and EU law with long experience in the trade union movement, particularly in collective uh, bargaining. As well as working for many years for the Swedish Blue Collar Union, ELO, he, he has worked as, uh, at for the European Trade Union Confederation as a legal advisor on the service and posting of workers' directives and also the Swedish Trade Union Office in Brussels. <clears throat> Sorry. He is the author of many publications on reports on a range of trade unions issues from democracy to full employment on posted workers. About the employer scales, welcome to Pierre Vicentini, who will represent the International Employer Organization as Senior Advisor and Regional Advisor for Europe and Central Asia. Paul Pierre Vicentini mainly deals with employers' activity related to the, the International Labour Organization. His area of expertise include social of uh, labour issues related to occupational safety and health, environment and sustainability, including the sustainable development goals and social prevention. Pierre Vicentini is also leading the EOE Global Occupational Safety and Health, GOSH Network, an exclusive uh, information sharing platform on all such issues for multinational and, uh, and enterprises. Unfortunately, uh, Pierre Vicentini couldn't uh, be with us. Uh, like, fortunately, he recorded a video for us in order to take the floor for the uh, employer's case. So thank you again. Uh, to be with us. This is a great chance and an honor to hear you today. Now it's time to give uh, you the floor. Each panelist will have about 20 minutes to present their point of view. We will keep about 20 oh, minutes, wow. okay. 20 minutes. Uh, ensuite, if I own uh, insert the guest box to ask your questions. The chat box can be used for technical uh, problems. Uh, il sera possible de poser des questions en français qui seront traduites en anglais. It will be possible to ask questions in French which will be translated into English. If you do not speak French, you can switch in English by clicking on the interpretation button at the bottom, bottom of your screen. The webinar will be recorded in order to display a replay soon. Thank you very much. Now, Mrs. Mrs. Marie Bolland, you have the floor. Thank you, Loic, um, for that introductions. And thank you, Mr. Nunes, for um, the opening remarks. I think um, you have both um, set the scene very nicely for us um, this morning, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever we are. And um, I'm looking forward uh, to hearing from the other de beaucoup the webinar, des uh, explore the challenges and hopes for the future and um, look i'm not going to speak now my job is to uh, offer some thoughts at the end and and respond to our other speakers so i'll uh, hand over now to dr william tigby and um, uh, look forward to his comments from the occupational medicine case point of view so thank you uh, dr william Thank you. Uh, if I yes. All right. So I've been introduced already. Uh, Alors bonjour, on m'a déjà présenté. Donc je suis le Dr. William Tigbe. Present my uh, perspective of um, work, health, and uh, sustainability uh, as an occupational uh, physician. Uh, I will uh, briefly say a bit of what we do. Uh, and uh, uh, talk about the case of uh, sustainable work, uh, the its benefits and what we should all, what I think we should all be doing uh, to make work sustainable. So from uh, the health point of view, uh, we- La santé. No. Early uh, Greek physicians as far as the second century BC uh, have noticed the importance of work as a, a resource for health and happiness. 
Um, but what we do say is that work needs to be good in order uh, to be uh, good for health. Uh, there are different types of. Uh, Il y a un effet bénéfique sur notre santé. Categories are certainly good. In the UK, we have uh, the issue of um, uh, zero uh, hour contracts, um, which is not really uh, very appealing. It means that you may have work today and tomorrow you have no work, and that means that you have no income. Work we know is a social determinant uh, of health. And I will uh, lay more emphasis on that here, as uh, uh, stated by the WHO, uh, that health inequalities are mainly uh, due to uh, the social determinants. And work is one of these very important uh, social determinants of uh, health. The Marmot, uh, review, Michael Marmot, uh, Donc, il y a eu un rapport yes, uh, in the UK, uh, in his review of uh, uh, fair society, healthy lives, uh, he calls for uh, fair employment and uh, for uh, for all uh, in order to uh, improve health and bridge health inequalities. We we'll talk about worklessness, so some people are not working, and we all know uh, the importance uh, or the problems with health uh, worklessness uh, that will uh, affect both your physical and mental health, uh, reduce life expectancy, uh, is uh, expensive to the healthcare. Uh, at the individual level, uh, these are people who cannot integrate in society. Uh, they lose confidence, and this will trickle down to uh, to their children and the subsequent. Et cela va avoir un... So, uh, not working or not having a good job does not just affect the individual, but also affects uh, their uh, children and subsequent generations. Uh, in view of uh, health. Uh, inequalities uh, and they, they I don't know how uh, those how many uh, will be familiar with this but uh, uh, the Marmot uh, report uh, talks about uh, life expectancy uh, and along the UK uh, underground uh, train lines um, for how life expectancy changes along the, trade li the train line um, depending on if you live in an affluent area or a deprived area. Areas of deprivation are uh, described in the UK uh, using postcodes. And uh, uh, if you enter a postcode of where, uh, of, of a particular area, you can tell uh, how affluent or how deprived the area is. Uh, I am speaking from Birmingham. Uh, and in Birmingham, uh, we have a similar maps uh, as in London. So these are three lines uh, equally in uh, Birmingham. And uh, if we just take uh, one of these, uh, for instance, if we uh, take, I don't know if my mouse is visible, uh, but if we take the, the rail line going northeast, uh, then what you will notice is that there is a, a gradual increase in life expectancy, uh, depending on where you live, whether male or female. Uh, so that uh, in some areas, uh, life expectancy can be for men will be as low as 74, uh, but it increases Dans to, uh, uh, in some particular areas. And we know that these uh, areas are the more affluent areas. Uh, same for men and for women. Uh, what happened in the um, in these affluent areas means that they do have they do have jobs. Uh, they have good jobs. Uh, which are safe and uh, have no occupational uh, exposures that are detrimental to their health. On the other hand, those uh, in the less affluent areas are people who uh, either are jobless or they, um, they are in such jobs that 
uh, they are exposed to diseases. Aux accidents, eux vont se trouver dans les quartiers des plus pauvres. People are in job, uh, they, they are made ill and they go out of work. And when out of work, there is a very uh, serious risk of not returning to work, particularly uh, after a year in the UK, we notice that a patient are likely to return if they have been off work uh, due to ill health uh, for a long time. And this is what we try to... Uh, On emploie si elles ont eu une absence longue. Um, the UK system is like that you go off, uh, then you are entitled to statutory uh, sick pay from your employer uh, after, um, usually after uh, six months, if uh, you are not returning to work, uh, many, many, many employers will stop paying. Uh, you go into employment support uh, allowance. Uh, some employers may be able to pay up to a year. Uh, very, very, very few uh, will pay uh, up to two years. Uh, and what that means is that such people, uh, if they, when they are assessed, they may be found to be uh, not fit to uh, return and uh, they remain economically inactive. Uh, or if, if they have been advised to uh, return to work, uh, they will go into uh, uh, job seekers uh, allowance. Uh, these are not uh, very uh, attractive situations to be in. Uh, due to that, ill health has been very expensive. Uh, I'm talking from the UK uh, point of view, but this will uh, fit well uh, in other countries. Uh, so it's expensive to the state, uh, the employer and the employee and their family uh, costing uh, billions. So uh, in occupational health, what uh, do we do? Uh, we are there uh, to uh, promote uh, and maintain the highest uh, degree of uh, physical, mental, and social uh, well-being. Uh, we are there to prevent disease, uh, adapt the work to, to the worker, uh, so that workers are placed in the right type of job to prevent ill health. Um, we the uh, ILO has a uh, clear uh, uh, policy lines for uh, the different uh, partners, uh, what countries should be doing, what organizations should be doing, and what occupational health uh, should uh, be should look like. Uh, in more detail, is that the ILO uh, uh, guidelines for uh, occupational health services uh, in order to uh, identify assess risks, uh, which is what we do mainly most of the times to risk assessment, uh, monitor uh, risks at work, uh, advise in the planning of the work so as to prevent uh, diseases and injuries, um, help uh, to develop uh, programs uh, that uh, run to improve health, uh, undertake health surveillance, uh, health promotion, and for those who uh, become ill to uh, undertake vocational rehabilitation to get people back qu'elles puissent bénéficier of uh, never returning. So what challenges uh, uh, do we uh, face uh, currently? Uh, because uh, work continue to change um, and, uh, and I particularly put this uh, uh, graph here to show that uh, you know em employers may be more preoccupied with safety issues, uh, but uh, diseases are much more uh, important uh, in the work environment. Um, we have an increasingly uh, aging workforce, particularly in the developed world, um, uh, and after the age of sixty, uh, people are likely to develop. Uh, medical conditions uh, that may not be uh, compatible with uh, all the tasks required of, uh, of them in their job. The young people uh, are particularly uh, very concerned about uh, you know, climate change, uh, sustainability, and uh, 
I mean, a recent study uh, by uh, um, uh, Boots in the UK uh, suggests that uh, young people will refuse to have a job if, uh, if the employer uh, does not uh, subscribe to sustainability, uh, which means that we need to uh, be aware, we as business physicians will, uh, and as advocates for health, uh, need to uh, be concerned with this and look for uh, how to measure some of these uh, environmental, social, and governance uh, to advise employers uh, to make sure that the workplace is a sustainable environment. Um, importantly, uh, we are not that many uh, in some countries, uh, and in, in some parts of Europe, um, occupational health coverage is, uh, is high. Uh, in the UK, this is not mandatory, and not all employer, employers have occupational physicians, or, or for that matter, an occupational health service. Uh, only 50% uh, in the, the, the last uh, count uh, have occupational health coverage. And out of these, only, only half are actually qualified occupational physicians, uh, with the other half who are generalists who um, have uh, got some basic uh, qualification in occupational health. The UK training program is only able to uh, pass out about 20 occupational physicians per year, so which means that this gap will never be filled. But that is a better situation as compared to other countries such as uh, the developing uh, ones. Um, and uh, I recently joined the um, the. Uh, Workplace Health uh, Without Borders uh, group, which I think is a very laudable idea uh, that uh, try to uh, provide training and support to uh, developing countries who have no uh, occupational health uh, service. Right. In, in terms of sustainability, um, uh, what what can we uh, do about it as uh, in occupational health? Uh, of course, uh, health and, and climate, uh, we know are very uh, linked, uh, not least uh, healthcare itself uh, is not exempt from uh, uh, harm to the, uh, the environment. Uh, due to its uh, use of resources, most of which are not uh, recycled. And uh, the resources substances that, are, uh, that pollute the environment. Uh, but on the other side of the equation, uh, as uh, the climate change uh, consequences, such as high uh, temperatures, are uh, um, harmful to health, uh, such as heat stress. Uh, which can lead to uh, kidney failure, heart disease, and so forth. Um, the extreme weather, uh, unpredictable uh, uh, weather patterns will lead into uh, floods, fires, drought, uh, pests, and uh, uh, communicable diseases uh, that will become uh, common uh, even in areas that do not have uh, uh, parasitic diseases, for instance. So it is um, climate change is a health concern. The what um, the, the, the what is the case uh, to act? We know that um, there is a pr there is pressure uh, from uh, society in general uh, for us to act. Uh, we know about uh, uh, COP twenty six recently, but and the ones preceding it. Uh, calling for uh, action equally from the healthcare uh, sector and from employers uh, above all. It, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, the health consequences are uh, many. And uh, for that matter, uh, investments and governments are expected uh, to respond to uh, sustainability to subscribe to the sustainability agenda by putting in uh, environmental, social, and governance uh, metrics. Uh, besides, um, health um, has 
health and uh, uh, climate change, uh, they have co-benefit, which I will outline in the in the next uh, slide. So if uh, we uh, designed uh, safe and sustainable work environments, uh, that will uh, not only good be good for the uh, environment, uh, but also uh, for health, uh, such as uh, reducing temperatures, uh, preventing um, uh, particular matter in the air, and for that matter, preventing diseases. Um, food, in terms of uh, uh, food, uh, if employers should have uh, in their policies uh, 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 a sustainable food and plant-based diets uh, for their workers, uh, and this can be advocated by occupational health, uh, a healthy diet is good for the environment, and it, of course it is good for your health. Uh, transportation is an area we can uh, all work together, uh, and areas such as uh, um, cycle schemes, car share, so that we are uh, polluting the environment less. Not only just for the workers, but also uh, in general terms. Uh, you see. Uh, very important and use of uh, renewable uh, energy sources. And the use of chemicals uh, at work uh, need to be uh, very thought through uh, so that uh, uh, so as to reduce um, environmental and uh, human exposure to uh, nauseous chemicals. Biodiversity as is important uh, for uh, for health, and uh, uh, reality employers should and and um, occupational health services uh, should focus on nature-based solutions uh, in the work environment. Uh, I have already mentioned uh, about the fact that uh, uh, climate anxiety is a particular uh, serious issue uh, with uh, young uh, people. And uh, employers need to be sensitive uh, to this. Uh, what we can provide in occupational health is um, the is a strategic leadership. Uh, they uh, provide ev evidence base uh, as advocates for uh, health uh, to influence uh, not just the employers but uh, the government and the wider society. Uh, because it, it is in everybody's interest that uh, we do have a sustainable environment and a sustainable work environment. Uh, putting all this together, I will, um, I've, I will use uh, this from the um, Futures uh, Forum uh, to illustrate uh, my point where we can act together. Um, so, um, the, if uh, what we're looking at here are these uh, spheres here, uh, the outer spheres, of course, hold more power compared to the inner spheres. Uh, so, uh, if the employers uh, will look at uh, their operations, uh, the, the, the mindset of the organization and the employees, uh, but these are influenced primarily by the products and services that are produced. Uh, but they produce, why do we produce uh, uh, services and products? Uh, it is because uh, what the supply chain demands and uh, uh, the supply chain is, is influenced uh, by the wider society, um, the, uh, the enabling environment that exists in terms of uh, policy research. Uh, standards and uh, partnerships, these will influence. So we need to act much more on the outside uh, with uh, providing, providing, providing um, the evidence and the leadership uh, and the advocacy that is required to influence the outer spheres so as to influence the work environment. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, uh, William. Um, yeah, look, I, I noted in particular um, your point about the fact that we perhaps focused on safety to the detriment of occupational disease prevention. And I was particularly struck by that because in Australia, we have a re-emergence of lung diseases that we perhaps thought um, we had managed in the past well, um, but I perhaps we dropped the ball a bit on those. Um, and just a reminder that if you want, if you have any questions arising from William's presentation to um, drop them into the Q&A box and we can deal with them at the end of the session. Um, so now I'd like to invite um, Klaus Michael, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, um, to provide his thoughts on hopes and challenges from the workers' perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I think you did uh, uh, quite a good pronunciation of my name. It's, it's Klaus. And, and let me first of all, thank you for the invitation speaking here today. And, and also thanks William before me for, for this very interesting presentation. Of, very uh, drawn into it. Uh, I would probably have somewhat of a European perspective since I represent the, I, I work for the European Trade Union Confederation. So, so, so please uh, bear with me in that way. Uh, so if we start a bit with, 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 with the, the, the challenges, uh, I think one of the challenges that we have to address is, is the fact that OSH, Occupational Health, safety and health is, is changing in, in, in some ways. It used to be an, an issue that dealt mostly with, with, with dangerous machines and, and accidents in different ways. Uh, but nowadays it's not only a, a physical uh, issue, it's also about mental and, and psychological aspects of, of work. And I think that's that's a challenge in itself. And, and um, as you know, uh, not only in Europe, I guess, but 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 all over the world, there are a lot of people going to work in the morning, but not everyone comes home. And in Europe, it's about 12 working people every day that don't come home from work because they have died at work. And uh, at the same time, we have to remember that, that at least in Europe, that fatal accidents are declining, but occupational diseases are increasing uh, largely. And we have uh, in Europe over 100,000 people dying annually from work-related cancer. Uh, and, and most of that could have been avoided by effective rules. And, and uh, occupational stress has in itself become a pandemic. And, and the European opinion poll uh, recently conducted by the EU OSHA shows the book. Uh, half of all workers consider uh, uh, work-related stress to be common in their workplace. Uh, and, and some of the most frequently mentioned causes of work-related stress are, are job reorganizations or, or job insecurity, could be work long, uh, long working hours, uh, excessive workload, uh, and, uh, but also harassment and violence at work. But we also have three out of five workers in Europe uh, reporting uh, MSD complaints, uh, according to EU OSHA. And, and it's also uh, higher among women workers. Uh, and, and most common type of, of mus mu musculoskeletal uh, disorders that are reported by workers are backache, uh, muscular pains in, in, in upper limbs. And, and uh, these uh, new forms of work and digitalization also increase the number of, of European workers being exposed to, to psychosocial factors. We can talk about cognitive overload and other forms of, of mental burdens. And, and uh, yeah, I think William was excellent in that way. He also raised the, the, the connection to, to, to climate change in a way that, that we also have more extreme weather uh, and temperatures in itself also is a, a sort of a new challenge for, for occupational health and safety. And, and uh, so, so there are a lot of, of, of challenges within the Osh area, uh, I think, particular uh, the, the, the mental 
uh, side of work uh, is going to be challenging. Uh, and we also have a, a generation of, of uh, younger workers coming into the labor market that seems to be, be in, in a less uh, good place in that way as well. Uh, yeah, and that takes me, I guess, uh, to, to, to the hopes, uh, which is the other theme here. Uh, and, and that is, uh, I think at least, that we are now leaving an, an market-oriented uh, era behind us. Um, we have in Europe have about 20 years of inactivity in the legisl legislative era. An end as we are leaving. Uh, yeah, calling it the neoliberal era uh, behind us, uh, where, 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 where markets and market forces were, were, were perceived as, as the sole problem solvers of, of essentially every uh, aspect of, of, of our societal problems and workplace problems. Um, uh, but uh, so that that's that's in itself a, a great hope, I think, uh, that, that we, we are now entering this new era. So, yeah, we, we, I also think that uh, it uh, hope is 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 also in that uh, that what happens at workplaces, uh, in in the reality is 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 key, and we need much more uh, better ways of, of uh, making sure that rules are applied uh, and enforced at, at at workplaces, and, and uh, I think there is a great understanding of that today. Uh, at least in Europe, uh, and I think that is also in itself a, a, a thing that is um, causing, have, uh, makes makes it re yeah reasonable to, to have hope in in, in in the future here. Uh, of course, we also know that unions make uh, workplaces safer, and and trade unions is is a major factor in in, in driving prevent prevention measures and guaranteeing that employers. Uh, actually comply with, with health and safety uh, rules uh, at, at all places. So, so, so I guess one of the best way to, to ensure that, that uh, OSH uh, is enforced is to, 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 to either form or join a union and make sure that you, you put pressure on the, on the employer. Uh, but it's not only in conflict. I think that in the area of OSH, it's, it's very much also a, uh, you have to find the ways of working jointly with employers. So you can address uh, uh, problems at the workplace uh, and, and get prevention uh, structures in, in place uh, at early stage. And, and I think that also social dialogue can be an, an important way forward here. And, and uh, in, in Europe, um, uh, we, we have had the, the, a new uh, strategic framework on occupational health and safety. And it has three key objectives and it's, it's anticipate, anticipating and managing change in the new world of work. Uh, second one is improving prevention of work related diseases and accidents. And thirdly, increasing preparedness for possible future health threats. And, and uh, yeah, the, the, the focus that we now have, have uh, from, from the European legislator uh, towards OSH is good. Uh, and, and that in itself is, is also a, a reason to, to, at least in the, in the European uh, area, to, to be optimistic uh, uh, about the future. But as, as always, in, 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 it's, it's always what we do. It's not what we talk about is also about doing. So, so, so I think that's going to be the most important challenge for trade unions uh, at European level, but also at national level, at workplace level, is to make sure that we not only talk about uh, how we improve uh, occupational health and safety, it's also about doing things. With that, I think I can stop. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, thank you, Klaus, um, for that. Because that that wasn't too oh, bad was <laughs> uh, for, <laughs> for your presentation, and I think particularly for emphasizing the role of collaboration and social dialogue. Um, 
And now I think we are having a presentation from Pierre, um, but I might just hand over to Loic to just organize that for us. Good day to all of you. And first, let me thank Loic Le Rouge and the CNRS Université de Bordeaux for the invitation to this round table. It is my pleasure to contribute to these events on behalf of the IOE, the International Organization of Employers. I would have liked to be with you now, to be able to interact with the audience and the other panelists, but I am currently attending another conference abroad. Turning now to the subject at hand, occupational health and sustainable work, I would like to reaffirm the strong commitment of employers worldwide to properly address the issue of occupational safety and health, and particularly when we know safety and health can save lives. Safety and health at work is of utmost importance to the employers, who also recognize that promoting safe and secure working environments for all is a core element of the ILO's funding mission and a prominent feature of the Sustainable Development Goals. Ensuring work is safe is the essential prerequisite for commencing work in an increasing number of the world's workplaces. Employers spend billions every year to drive and further improve health and safety in their workplaces. In countries around the world, employers engage every day with governments on these issues. And my fellow counterparts certainly know this. Every day, in millions of workplaces, employers and employees work together on safety. Protecting working lives while ensuring business continuity is top priority for employers. The pandemic has underscored the importance of healthy and safe working environments. And in the COVID-19 crisis, companies have made incredible efforts to adjust work organization, to put in place adequate safety protocols, to secure protective equipment, to encourage workers to adhere to necessary hygiene and distancing measures and foster confidence and vaccination. Employers' organizations have played a supportive role all along the way. We have also seen how important sustainability is for the supply chain when it comes to uh, health and safety. And those who believe that health and safety at work will go back to normal after COVID-19 are wrong. Health and safety at work should and will be reinforced and enforced. But we need certainty to create the scenarios for greater health and safety protection. And this requires a cooperation of the public sector with employers through their national organizations. We cannot be successful in our answers if we do not involve all the stakeholders. Governments, employers and workers all have a role to play in securing a safe and healthy working environment through a system of defined rights, responsibilities and duties, taking into consideration national conditions and each country's level of development and where the principle of prevention is accorded at the highest priority. Employers and unions have often joined efforts to address these issues. This is, for example, what takes place in the garment industry after the Rana Plaza accident. However, in too many countries, it is not common that employers and workers are called to work together with governments. And we must ask ourselves, what can we do better in the future? How can we work better together using our capacities in a more beneficial way? How to cooperate better with governments? What is the kind of incentives that employers and workers need for a sustainable future? Provisions need to be realistic, smart and clear. Therefore, we need new attitudes, open mindsets, a lively culture of prevention, and we are not there yet. Going forward, resilient national occupational safety and health systems can surely support employers and workers in creating safe and healthy working conditions. Occupational health and safety should be seen as both a vector for well-being and performance, and the approach should favor a culture of prevention and not just add up standards. Bearing that in mind, the role of the social partners in the development of occupational health policies at international, national, branch and company level is critical. Social dialogue remains paramount in this regard. The dynamic and evolving transformation and crisis in which we are living pandemic, digitalization of work, dematerialization of time and workplaces, climate change, they provide challenges and opportunities. The disruptive nature of this COVID pandemic has speed up change at the workplace. 
working time, working place, such essential concepts from a health and health safety workplace perspective are transforming. Digital workplace realities, telework, are becoming, becoming more the rule. Prevention is more important than ever, and efforts are needed to further promote the culture of prevention and health and safety capacities of employers and workers. Again, creating safe and healthy working environment is a cooperative effort of employers, workers, governments and other stakeholders. In our views, the ILO Convention 187 is the instrument that can best support the development of a preventative OSH culture and the application of a system to manage OSH at national level. This promotional framework provides for a coherent and systematic approach to OSH and allows ratifying member states the necessary flexibility in implementing the Convention, regardless of the level of development. We indeed need to think especially about the developing countries, where the governance and the level of ownership of regulation is a challenge. Prevention is an integral part of employers' activities, as high safety and health standards uh, at work go hand in hand with good business performance. Compliance with public health regulation and safety and health standards at work should match with the enhancements of productivity. However, some issues will necessitate particular attention. First, telework. The pandemic has triggered a massive recourse to telework. This modality of work is likely to remain widespread also after the pandemic. Adjusting health and safety practices and procedures as well as clarifying responsibilities in case of remote working to combine necessary flexibility with adequate safety will be key. The impact of teleworking on the physical and mental health and social well-being of workers can be significant. However, with proper planning, organization and health and safety support, there are benefits such as improved work-life balance, opportunities for flexible working hours and physical activity, reduced traffic and commuting time and a decrease in air pollution, all of which can improve physical and mental health and social well-being. Teleworking can also lead to higher productivity and lower operational costs for many companies. Secondly, mental health. In addition to physical health, the pandemic has had impact on mental health. While a lot clearly go beyond the remit of the workplace, employers play an important role in supporting workers' well-being. More support will be needed on managing psychosocial risks, promoting health and well-being at the workplaces and facilitating professional integration of people with mental health issues. A critical dimension in this area is the need for practical guidance or training for managers, as well as employees, on how to start and conduct conversations with an employee who has or might have a mental health condition. Employers play an important role in enhancing the mental health and productivity of their workforce, Enterprises that implement mental health policy and programs often find there are benefits in doing so. The workplace can provide a vital setting for promoting good mental health. The unprecedented times we all went through offer opportunities to expand efforts and achievements in this field. We should continue further. Addressing mental health issues and well-being in the workplace is a shared responsibility between employer and employee. Psychosocial risk assessment, which is supportive of innovative work organization and creative job design, can be a powerful tool and can assist employees with managing their mental health and pursuit of healthy lifestyles. Third, the climate change. Climate change and environmental degradation will shape safety and health at work and the actions that are needed to protect workers as they introduce or amplify risks in the future. We believe first step is to conduct assessment of OSH risk resulting from climate change, identify adequate prevention and protection and safety processes. Adverse OSH outcomes associated with climate change will be more serious in workplaces and countries which do not have sufficient measures in place, so it is important to address those at national level. The ILO guidelines for a just transition towards environmentally sustainable economies and society for all, which was adopted in 2015, provide a comprehensive policy framework. The guidelines specifically invite governments, in consultation with governments and social partners, 
to conduct assessments of increase or new occupational safety and health risk resulting from climate change or other risk related to human health and the environment and to identify adequate prevention and protection measures to seek to ensure occupational safety and health. It will be important to incentivize companies and support technical assistance to conduct research to better understand the range of OSH risks across the life cycle of products, new technologies and jobs, and use this knowledge to improve prevention and safety in the workplace. First, informality. And last but not least, the experience shows that informal economies are often where health and safety deficits are high, productivity is low, and social safety nets lacking. Thus, fostering transition from informality to formality should be among our top priorities. Informality is the root cause of so many accidents, by far the highest. We need to get it under control. For example, help enterprises in the informal sector to register so that we can facilitate access to financial means, improve the framework conditions, in particular the OSH requirements, but also the skill developments, etc. Collaboration can contribute to developing the necessary safety and health culture, while overall responsibility for safety and health at the workplace is the responsibility of the employer. Its management can be enhanced if the workplace are ready as a preventative safety mindset. For example, workers need to cooperate with the employer, such as by using personal protective equipment correctly and by respecting safety and health rules and appropriate behaviour. Employers stress that the creation of safety and health culture, where the principle of prevention is given the highest priority, will positively impact on safety messages in the workplace, thereby reducing risks. It therefore makes business sense for employers to be part of a national effort to ensuring safe and healthy back to workplaces. I would like now to conclude in highlighting that employers reiterate the strong commitments to play their part in investing and securing a safe and healthy working environment. Achieving safety and health at work is a chair responsibility and there is room for reinforcing synergies as to avoid fragmentation of efforts and to achieve impact. And if you allow me, I will leave you now with some final takeaways, calling on the need to first explore new ways and adopt innovative approaches that leave behind preconceived ideas and outdated paradigms. Secondly, to continue bringing company to the conversation to national employers and business membership organizations and keep SMEs in the scope as they are the ones most struggling with OSH requirements. Thirdly, build on this trust relationship to foster a culture of prevention with rights and duties, taking into consideration national conditions and each country's level of development. Third, continue raising awareness on this key topic, and this is exactly what you are doing today, and provide capacity building to the relevant stakeholders and in particular to social partners. I thank you for your attention and I really wish you all fruitful exchanges. Um, so, yes, thank you um, to Pierre for um, preparing that um, video for us tonight or uh, it's tonight with me um, this morning. Um, so my job now, I just thought I would um, provide a few thoughts of my own. Um, and I frame these thoughts to be um, perhaps a little bit provocative, but um, my intention is, is to provoke some questions um, and then I'll respond specifically to some of the issues raised by our eminent speakers tonight uh, this, at the seminar. Uh, so I'll be making two points about what I see as the challenge of diminishing worker representation in occupational health and safety matters at workplaces. And the first challenge is that it has the potential um, to undermine the self-regulation model of occupational health and safety management. And the second is that it has the potential to challenge tripartite approaches upon which the work of the ILO itself is founded. Um, I noted that, that Mr. Nunes in his opening remarks uh, signaled that. So I found myself considering the legal framework within which many jurisdictions regulate occupational health and safety. And this is the self-regulatory framework which emerged in the 1970s and 80s. 
Now, as we know, self-regulation involves workers and management working together to implement and improve upon the occupational health and safety standards set by the state, with employers having a duty to consult with their workers. A significant challenge I see with the changing nature of work and the workplace is the undermining of worker representation and participation in occupational health and safety matters, and the danger that brings for the sustainability of the self-regulation model that many jurisdictions are operating within, including Australia, for example. With new business models, which are designed to avoid the traditional employer-employee relationship, and its associated rights and obligations. With union busting activities of the big tech companies like Amazon and Google, and with a general decline in union membership since the 1980s, I'm suggesting that the contextual assumptions and conditions that inform the creation of the self-regulatory system of occupational health and safety law no longer exists. This model, was developed when the most common workplaces were highly unionized manufacturing operations, most often operating in large factory settings, where the numbers of workers were enough to support the creation of work groups with their own elected health and safety representatives. As we know, and as has been reiterated tonight, worker representation necessarily forms a central component of effective self-regulation. And the wide range of international evidence bears witness to the role it can play in improving health and safety standards and outcomes. I'm suggesting that the reduction of worker representation, particularly by unions in workplaces, has the potential to lead to an absence of a key and effective component of the work health and safety self-regulation framework. In the United States, nearly 50% of food delivery workers have reported being in a crash or accident while delivering. Australian workers' compensation claims statistics show that the six food delivery fatalities which occurred in 2020 would place the gig economy in the top five most dangerous industries in terms of numbers of fatalities in Australia. And yet there is little of any worker representation in, in, these in, in this industry. One of the objectives of the Work Health and Safety Act in Australia is to encourage unions and employer organizations to take a constructive role in promoting improvements in work health and safety practices. Another objective is to provide for fair and effective workplace representation, consultation, cooperation and issue resolution in relation to work health and safety. In the absence of union representation, with a growing number of small and micro businesses and with the digitization of work, this objective, I suggest, is increasingly difficult to meet. There is a right of entry for union officials in Australia However, it's, it is highly regulated. A criticism that is often raised by employers about work health and safety union right of entry is that unions are, quote, misusing it for industrial relations purposes. However, arguably, industrial issues like working hours, rosters, and staffing levels are fundamental to a worker's health and safety, particularly in aged and healthcare workplaces, and particularly in the context of managing the risks to a worker's psychological health. Indeed, as William highlighted tonight, um, you know, issues around work design and, and workplace conditions, which in Australia we tend to call industrial uh, relations issues, um, are fundamental to decent and sustainable work. And what this highlights, I guess, and as others have noted in this webinar, uh, webinar, lots of lines are blurring. There is a blurring of lines between work and the rest of life, between occupational health and public health, and between occupational health and safety and industrial relations. And again, as William highlighted, work is a key social determinant of health. And so in a way, it's not even a blurring of the line. It, it, it always was so. Uh, the, uh, health at work is, is fundamental to, to health in general. Um, the tripartite representation, as we know, tripartite representation of governments, workers and employers is at the heart of the ILO's labour standards. 
However, the success of tripartism relies on the relative equality of the three parties involved. I note that the ILO Future of Work initiative recognized two challenging and growing inequalities, which will further challenge the work of the ILO into the future. The first is between companies with the upsurge of big tech companies in the last decade, between capital and labor, linked to the global shrinking of unionism with both inequalities expected to increase into the future. As many commentators have noted, these growing inequalities will test ILO standards, but they also reinforce their importance. I'm also suggesting that they'll test the effectiveness of the self-regulatory legal frameworks of occupational health and safety management within which many, many industrialized, industrialized jurisdictions work. I note in this context that the Australian government influenced the change in wording of the ILO Global Commission on the Future of Work, which initially had its objective of establishing a universal labour guarantee with adequate living wages, limits on working hours and safety and health at work. The final wording spoke of a quote, ILO centenary declaration on the future of work with key ideas, including that the ILO should direct its efforts to supporting the private sector through an enabling environment for sustainable enterprises. This new wording, I think, plays into the narrative of occupational health and safety standards and regulation being burdensome red tape, which holds back business. It is perhaps also an example of what Geoffrey Hilford called, quote, the unspoken taken for granted values of employer power, management control, and the maintenance of production, trumping the application of human rights values. That is the right to safe and healthy working conditions. Currently, as we know, the ILO recognizes four fundamental principles and rights, which are freedom of association and the effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining, the elimination of forced or compulsory labor, the abolition of child labor and the elimination of discrimination in respect of employment and occupation. In 2019, the United Nations urged the ILO to immediately recognize and adopt safe and healthy working conditions as one of its fundamental principles and rights at work. In response, the governing body of the ILO approved a quote, roadmap as a planning tool, which can be reviewed and modified by the governing body based on progress made for the consideration of including safe and healthy working conditions in the ILO's framework of fundamental principles and rights at work, end quote. So these words, which arguably mean nothing in English and probably in French too, as they're translated, um, no doubt reflect the fact that the ILO has a tripartite structure, which means that all standards, policies, and programs require the balancing of different, often competing agendas and approval from the representatives of governments, employers, and workers. Although I do note that in the opening uh, words, uh, Mr. Nunes did say that there was a meeting in June uh, where this issue is being discussed. So I'm hopeful that this is one of the optimistic uh, outcomes of this uh, webinar, webinar, that there will be some progress made in June. But anyway, as one worker commented on the centenary declaration, um, that is tripartism, that is democracy, you cannot have it all. But it does beg the question, I think, of when it comes to ensuring a fundamental human right to safe and healthy working conditions, shouldn't we, aiming, shouldn't we be aiming to have it all? So uh, they were my uh, initial thoughts before I heard the speakers tonight. Um, so... I guess my response to the speakers is, in a way, they've also been um, looking at how traditionally we've looked at occupational health and safety. Um, and I guess like me in the context of the legal framework, I think they've all suggested that we need to shift perhaps our, our traditional lenses that we've looked at occupational health and safety. Uh, for example, William really reinforced, you know, that we have tended to look at uh, in the past as regulators and practitioners, the, the um, safety risks to physical health, um, whereas we have, haven't put as much emphasis perhaps in recent years into the prevention of occupational diseases. 
And certainly the risks to psychological health um, has become more and more of an issue um, everywhere. And in Australia, for example, um, we're looking at um, amending regulations to include um, rules around preventing um, rules about managing psychosocial hazards to prevent psychological injury to workers. Um, the other um, um, shift, as uh, Klaus mentioned, was uh, around how businesses are changing and the markets are changing, and he was quite hopeful around that. Um, but I guess the, the main hope I took from this, and particularly from listening to Pierre at, at the end, is really the commitment again to, to tripartism. Um, because uh, however, I suppose, um, flawed it may be, or however we might not all get what we want, um, inevitably I think it does remain um, in the context of managing health and safety the best model to ensure, um, particularly if there's good worker representation, good consultation processes, um, good union representation, um, you know, to create that equal footing of, of workers, employers and government, um, that the future looks bright uh, for us to take on these challenges, working together, and reinforcing, as I say, the importance of social dialogue and that tripartite approach that has done us well for, for the last hundred years. So um, we are a bit early, um, but to finish, but it does allow us, I guess, um, lots of time for questions. So Loic, I might end there and hand over to you and see if people have questions in response to the presentations and some of those closing remarks for me, I guess. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. Thank you very much, all, all the panelists for your interesting presentations and uh, contribution. Thank you also for uh, having respected the schedule on the time. So now it's, it's time to close, to be on time to close the, the one table. Uh, I think it's possible to stop thinking uh, 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 of workers as subject to accidents and take into account the effect of production on organizational processes on occupational uh, public on environmental health. I, I think it's also uh, 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 a key point. So many thanks for joining us today and for your attention. The replay, the replay will be available soon on uh, YouTube to the Sext channel. But great thanks to uh, Giselle Massol and Ray Cook from Akita Introduction for for the simultaneous translation. Have a nice day or have a nice evening and see you soon for new events of the CX. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye bye.